food, traditional Chinese medicine, aphrodisiacs, and symbols like paperweights or satchels, things to make out of turtles. The result is that species across Asia, it's a very long elevator pitch, but it's a very high skyscraper. The result <laughs> is that species across Asia have been decimated and the collectors, poachers, smugglers, and those who are their customers are going elsewhere in the world, including North America, specifically the southeast of North America, the states of Louisiana, Texas, and Florida. And there's an intriguing cabal of what you might call good old boys in the southeast who know these regions and know the animals, poaching the animals, and then connecting with the middlemen, and they almost always are men, who are bicultural and bilingual, often on the coasts, who can then engage in the commerce over to Asia. That's the story. So how to create a storyline is one of my challenges to write the book about it in order to inform my research and reporting to get the material to write the story. Everybody has a turtle story, is the conceit, is the trope that I have. So I'm gonna look around the room here and I'm gonna find somebody I don't know because my class is here and I'm not gonna pick on this guy who is in my class, but this guy who I don't know. What's your name? My name's Phil. Phil, good morning. What's your turtle story? My turtle story. Um, well, I'll go the pop culture way and say I was raised on Ninja Turtles. Okay, there's, a, there's enough there. Not great because <laughs> everybody has some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle story. Seth, what's your turtle story? You have a turtle story. I promise you, you do. This is a parlor <laughs> trick that works. So when I Okay, there's a turtle story. There's a connection, and that phrase has all kinds of significance in our culture and in other cultures. What? No, you're one of my students. I, I'm going to avoid my students here. I don't know you. What's your name? Meredith. Meredith, what's your turtle story? Um, ooh, I love turtles. But probably. That's a home run right there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I was sending you the signal. Um, picking up the turtle in the middle of the road the neighborhood, so we can go back to the grass and go into the neighborhood. So this, thank you. What's intriguing about this trope is that everybody does have a turtle story. Everybody has a turtle story. It is, it, it cannot fail. And so one of the storylines through the book is this connection, which immediately allows me the license to go from the science to the everyman. That's one of the devices that, that I use and it also helps the story, which is a quest. It's my quest. I, I use what I call the, the I, I take advantage of the gentle use of the first person. The book's not about me, but I am evident in the book. I'm participatory. I'm a participatory advocacy journalist in the book. And the storyline uses the everybody has a turtle story as a device which both brings out some of the personality of the people I'm talking with and also allows the reader in theory to be able to, to uh, relate to it. So Fred is another, is another device that I use like that. Fred, well, before I introduce you to Fred, but let me tell you how I get into the, the, the book. And the, the book starts in Cuba. The book starts in Cuba with a Santeria priest. And the Santeria priest with whom I just engaged in a lengthy conversation interview because Santeria includes at times the sacrifice of turtles as part of, of uh, the practice. And so uh, I, I get up from this uh, experience with this guy and, and uh, as we're saying goodbye, he says, do you have a turtle in the house? And I say, not yet, because I hadn't really occurred to me, but I figured I'd better say not yet and not no, because that would suggest uh, 
a lack of enthusiasm for what he was probably going to say next, which was, you must, he prescribes, for the good energy and for your health. And, and so from that, which, uh, with, which is the goodbye to him, I introduce the reader to the turtle that I got. And the, so the turtle provides a, a parallel with the everybody has a turtle story. And I fostered a turtle for much of the period of researching this book and relate to the turtle periodically, usually at the end of chapters, as my experiences with the turtle continue. So again, th these are devices that I think work that I use in order to, to uh, make it more comfortable for the reader to deal with some of the hard science and the hard news reporting that's, that's in the book. I want to give you the rundown on the table of contents because this is another device that I use regarding taking the science and trying to make it accessible. But first, as we say on the radio, I, I used something else that I, and all of this I'm projecting, book's not out yet, but I'm figuring this is all going to work. I was able to get the foreword to be authored by Richard Branson. So that's pretty good deal just on the face of it because he's this businessman and, and uh, bon vivant of international intrigue. However, who knows about his turtle history? Nobody in the room. So that creates something else that's an opening in the book. Richard Branson has an island. You know about his island? It's Neckar. It's, uh, it was hit by one of the hurricanes that we just experienced, it's in the Caribbean, and it is an animal refuge. And one of the animals, one of the species, multiple uh, turtle tortoise species that he has there are endangered, and he is very much a proponent of wildlife conservation. So I have this name attached to the book that is not just there for the sake of the name, but because he is intimately involved in what the book is about, because the book is a call to action. So here are the, the chapter titles, The Majestic Turtle, Timeless Allure, The Voracious Consumers, The Todd Reed Marketplaces, The Prodigious Farms, The Illicit Hunts, The Wily Smugglers, The Frustrated Cops, The Pitiful Casualties, The Conflicted Public, The Dedicated Conservationists, The Imminent Future. And, and all of this, again, attempts to drive the story. And now I introduce you to, to uh, Fred. And, and uh, Fred, Fred comes via a, a service that uh, some of you may engage in. It's a company that contracts with Federal Express and with UPS, and it's called shipmyreptile.com and so Fred shows up on the on the uh, on the porch and um, and Sheila my wife uh, uh, unpacks him and he's running around the house and and then the the uh, fact that he's not eating for a couple of days worries Sheila but the next day I sent an email off to Matt Frankel Matt Frankel is the guy who he's an emergency room physician and he has a he has a refuge in prescott arizona he and i are both on the advisory board of the turtle conservancy and when i put the word out that i needed a turtle he offered me the turtle so so i i wrote to him and i wrote an email to him and said fred survived the night and and, and i was expressing concerned because he wasn't eating and drinking. And Frankel's response makes fun of us and offers some solace for our concerns. Survive the night, he writes. He's a turtle. He will survive the decade, mm -hmm. even the election. This was a month before Trump. <laughs> this is part of their magic, he raves. 300 million years. And I write back that Sheila loves Fred already. Glad he's in a good home, Frankel responds. But when I relate Sheila's concerned that Fred's lonely in his house. He has a house in the living room. 
and tell Frankel of her scheme to cook some organic chicken for Fred instead of feeding him the dog food that Frankel recommended. Frankel is undone. Turtles live alone. He would probably prefer the bugs off of four day old roadkill to boiled chicken. Dog food is fine. And so again, <laughs> Frankel becomes a device to be able to introduce the science by a hymn to us who stand in, I would hope, as the every man and every woman, and in our ignorance, I'll share it with Sheila, of buying the dog food then when she did from Whole Foods to make sure that Frank, uh, Fred got uh, uh, organic dog food. <laughs> so uh, this is probably more about, about Sheila and me than should be on the recording in terms of the life we live. So, so the device then is, is uh, the, the devices are, are multiple. The, the um, interviews with me playing every man allow the experts to explain and then me to ask for the clarification. And in theory, it allows the reader I hope to identify with me and they get to be or are forced to be in exotic locales. This was a five continent research trip. They get to experience the turtles, both Fred and those turtles that I am experiencing otherwise. And, and they get to gain knowledge. And um, yeah, there's one other piece I wanted to read to you here, which is, um, here's, a, here's an example. So it's Easter morning in the Swabian Alps, and almost everything is closed for the holiday, but not the museum in sleepy little Trossingen, a village just over an hour car ride south of Stuttgart. Progano Celles was unearthed in a gully here, and one of the fossilized ur turtles found is housed among replica skeletons of the, design, of the dinosaurs it roamed with, resting on its back in a glass case. The museum's volunteer curator, Volker Knight, is opening the case for me. I want to commute hands-on with the oldest stem turtle yet discovered, the extinct immediate precursor to contemporary turtles. To touch her especially, he says about Programma Chili's, how long are you and I going to live? This girl lived before we even think about it. Imagine what she has seen. Curator Neep casually swings the glass door open and invites me to time travel back 210 million years and touch the Programicelli's lying immobile on her back, two claws grasping at the air, dragon-like spikes on the edge of her carapace, protecting her and making her look so much like the distant cousin of an alligator snapping turtle. I reach into the case to grab the claw and I hold it. Careful, calls out night, don't break it. So this idea of again, being there with the animal and that sets up the opportunity to be able to talk about what is the relationship of our contemporary alligator snapping turtle to this, the earliest fur turtle, the earliest turtle that did commingle with the dinosaurs and, and is connected to us. That's, that's how I designed the research was to try to find these, or some of the research, to try, try to find these kinds of openings to be able to make it tell the story. I neglected to say at the beginning, please interrupt me anytime you would like, both to give me a chance to take a sip of coffee and for anything that you have that you'd like to say. Good day, Troy. Thank you for coming. So the devices, the interviews, and and then Fred, and and then uh, the 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 tangle with ethics. I believe we got into this in the class a little bit. It was this class earlier this week, but I'm. When I was in Cuba, I went to a restaurant. Did we talk about this at this class? Yeah, we went to, I went to a restaurant, a high-end restaurant in Miramar and talked to, talked to the waiter after the waiter ran down what was for, available for dinner, the fish, the beef, the poultry, and as he put it, the tortuga. And so I talked with the, the waiter over by the kitchen in quite a bit of detail without identifying myself as a reporter. And in fact, he asked me if I 
if, if I'm a reporter, and my response to him was to say I was a, that I am a university professor, which apparently I am, based on where we are and how I was introduced. So, so the the research included some ethical, moral entanglements, or at least questions, or at least passing uh, concerns about the appropriateness of how I was developing the material. And since he was offering an illegal meal, and uh, and that puts him in the bad guy category for me. I gave myself full license to have this conversation with him and include it as part of the research for the book. In fact, I look at it as a extraordinary lucky break. And since I didn't solicit him, I feel in the clear on that and probably would feel in the clear even if I had solicited him, even if I had said when he went through the whole thing, if I said, hey, don't you have turtle? This is an interesting push and pull, as we discussed in the class earlier this week. This is a question that was dealt with by the New York Times reporter who did the story you may have seen on Sunday on the guerrilla poaching and trafficking. And he wrote a piece on the inside of the front section on page two about how he would have been compromised if he had been asked if he were a reporter because of New York Times policy. I don't have that policy because I'm writing as an independent journalist. And, and, uh, and so these are, those are the devices that, that I use for the basic devices for the research, the interviews, Fred as a connection. And, uh, and, and then, I had to determine how I'm going to make use of these interviews because this is very, one of the reasons I'm happy to have the interview class here is this is a very interview driven project. The research for this is, is uh, there's, there's, there's library work and other type of more traditional academic research, but it's very interview driven. One thing I needed was to gain access to prisons because it's illegal what many of these poachers, if by definition, if they're a poacher and the traffickers are doing. And so I, I gained access to one prisoner who was quite an experienced and prolific trafficker and was cooling his cliche heels at a federal prison in Morgantown, West Virginia. One of the problems that that presented was that the federal prison system makes rules prison to prison on how these interviews can be conducted and this was an interview that was mandated to not include any kind of recording device so i spent two hours with this guy with a paper and pen and i don't know about the rest of you but i'm not used to that much writing and also keeping up with a guy and a guy from the south side of chicago who talks about this fast and it it uh it was a research challenge, just just uh, all of these, the mechanics of all of this to get through the prison system it took months to get the approval, plus that approval had to come from him, plus Morgantown, West Virginia is not just east of Springfield, so all of these things had to be put together, and then to have the, the very specific amount of time with him and the amount of time that uh, that without a recording device, the, the payoff there is not just the content, although the content was rich because he was one of these good old boys, but but also the atmosphere to put him into the prison is a reality that would be much different had he been on the telephone or had it been once he was out of prison. But getting somebody out of prison also can be of some value. And I talked to another one of these types up in Washington State who had recently been released from prison. This, this, just in terms of the research challenge, very different kinds of research challenges that we all have. But the, again, the mechanics of, of dealing with this guy, trying to convince him to finally meet with me at some chain restaurant along an I-5 in the middle of nowhere in Washington State and to talk just getting him to return phone calls, something the interview class will relate to, continually going after him. It doesn't seem like 
a, a very uh, complicated research tool, but not feeling any compunction about calling him over and over and over again and texting him over and over again and trying to develop a relationship with him so that he would accept the idea of sitting down with me took months, months to get a hold of this guy. And, um, and yet the payoff was, was uh, quite terrific. He's a guy who just turned bad as best I can determine. He ran a pet shop and these intermediaries that I was talking about is uh, these bilingual, bicultural people on the coast that speak Chinese and English and go back and forth quite easily, convinced him to use his store as a front and to go into the bad guy business. Hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned that you were sort of a, doing this out of a journal, advocacy journalism uh, perspective, uh, wanting to spark some kind of change. How did you hide your contempt for people, like you just mentioned, job in interviewing them? Well, this, with this last guy, he's at least professing to be born again, and he thinks what he did is awful. And, and with the guy in, who's in prison, that wasn't a problem because he's so, so arrogant, he was happy to engage in a certain amount of verbal conflict. With, with others, I don't think that there's anything wrong in the research process to be as neutral as possible in my presentation. I don't need to tell somebody with whom I disagree that I disagree with them unless I think it can trigger more information, passion that will be of value to the story. But I can I can poker face it. And uh, I yeah, I'm saying how did you do that? Like, what what did you use to end the interview? I'm a university researcher or a investigative journalist, whichever is going to serve me at the moment. It's very nice to be bifurcated that way. And um, and and I'm, I want to learn about what it is you're doing so that I can better understand, perhaps even say better understand what you may consider the overreach of federal and international, federal law and international treaties or the inappropriate behavior from your point of view of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. Yeah. Uh, access. So access in prison. Access over distance. Oh, this is the different guy. Well, little Fred is a box turtle, and he's just a sweet little guy. And um, except when he's eating worms from the pet department in Kmart <laughs> and live worms, then he's ferocious. But but little Fred. And, and I am not a turtle scientist. I'm a journalist and apparently university professor. And, and so, so I am learning about this with the reader. And here's little Fred. And Fred, uh, Fred's free. I, mean, I fostered him. Matt Frankel would gladly have given him to me. And Fred's free. Now, what looks just like Fred to me, and maybe to many of you, is a Yunnan box turtle. Yunnan box turtle was declared extinct for many of the reasons that we have problems today, habitat loss, uh, over, over hunting, and, um, and, and, uh, and then about 10 years ago, a colony was found, a very small colony. The result has been pressure on this colony from those who seek the rare, the exotic, the unavailable, the illegal. And so this turtle, the Yunnan box turtle, is listed in places where it shouldn't be listed because it shouldn't be sold. It's illegal to sell them for would you like to guess? And if I'd said this in class already, you guys can't guess. But uh, would you like to guess how much the Yuan box turtle goes for on the black market? Like a single turtle? A single turtle. One turtle. One turtle. Um, you're stolen. Thousand. Thousand dollars. A million. No, but that's how little high. <laughs> One more. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. And we have we have to always have to have these things grouped in threes. Pardon? Fifty. Fifty thousand says the man in the red sweater. Um, so. Um, these are going for 200,000 US dollars. 
apparently, oh. these are how the listings are. Now, this this is I mean, this does this does a lot of things. The the room just said wow. So that means to me, as the as the um, predatory journalist, that that the that there's a story here, and it means to me as the academic researcher that I need to find out more about this and see see what this means that it's that that it's out there with this kind of price tag on it. So it turns out that the Yunnan box turtle is from pardon it's from China from Yunnan province and 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 here's the the um, the pulling back the curtain a little bit so much of this stuff was as I'm sure most of you know is is uh, so I don't know if luck's the right word but serendipity so two years ago before this project really got underway we have a we have an exchange program here where professors come in from universities outside of the United States and and are often coupled with with those of us who are here and I was put together with a professor from Kunming University a wonderful woman who spent the year coming to all my classes and we got to know each other and then she went back to China and then I encountered the Yunnan box turtle and the need I felt to see a Yunnan box turtle and talk to the guy who found the colony and be in that habitat well she's a professor at Kunming University Kunming is the capital of Yunnan province and right down the street from her house is the zoological society where this professor who discovered the turtle practices. So it was just this lovely piece of serendipity. She provided translation. She got in touch with him in advance. She made the arrangements for me to be able to talk to him. He's very closed off. He doesn't talk to anybody. He's afraid of anybody finding out where these wild colonies are. He's afraid of the turtles that are in the institute being poached, the place being attacked. There's quite the security there. There are 10 from the wild and 10 that they bred in, in uh, captivity. And they're trying to maintain these uh, survival colonies while they're looking to see if there's anything else in the wild and while they're protecting the place where they did find them. So this was a rich piece of the research that was that I can't take any credit for other than luck and taking advantage of, of that luck. And I ended up there with her and at the Institute with the guy who found them and hanging out with this turtle, which looked exactly like Fred to me. <laughs> same size, same appearance. Obviously, the specifics can be pointed out to me and then I can I can relay that information to the reader, if there's a reader, but then, then again, I have the the uh, atmosphere. I have the primary source material of talking with him and having his papers, and I'm touching the two hundred thousand dollar turtle, which is, I suppose, kind of cool. Uh, I don't know. Is that kind of cool? That, I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> A couple other examples of access. There's there's a potential danger in the in the markets in Bangkok and Jakarta, and uh, and to a lesser extent in Hong Kong, where the turtles that are high priced, not as high priced as the Yunnan box turtle, are located. The the um, the trade is open but illegal. And so going into talking to these people requires a certain amount of preparation. I think a fixer knowing how far to push as, as you were suggesting during the querying period, how to ask questions, how to identify what's there. I would be taking pictures of things that were offered that were offered as illegal and then emailing those pictures back to the executive director of the Turtle Conservancy to confirm the identities because these things could be offered as if they were illegal at high prices and they could be common from to my office i would not necessarily know them and then developing the relationship with the police on the other side of this the fish and wildlife service and a particular agent who was dealing 
in Louisiana where this picture was taken with a gang that was taking loggerhead alligator, um, alligator snapping turtles, known as loggerheads down there, and taking them from Texas over to Louisiana. Texas, and this is an example of the complexity of the laws in Texas where they're protected, to, over to Louisiana where they're not for the most part protected. And so by crossing that border, which is easy enough to cross, they were able to launder effectively these kinds of, of turtles. And this agent worked several years on busting a gang that had, that had gone through an extraordinary number of these turtles that are in jeopardy, that are endangered. And, and that took months of relationship building also to develop the trust with him so that he would talk to me and then politics intruding again, since the Trump administration has taken over, there's a silencing from the top down and, and in terms of uh, orders from the top to not be talking as openly as we might all want our government servants to talk to us. So I have to negotiate also with his boss to get his boss to authorize him, even after he and I had developed a, a good personal relationship, it's now a friendship to get him to talk. And finally, an example of the access issues is uh, the paper trail. There's a guy named Kai Zhu that I'll bet all of you have heard of. Kai Zhu, you would not necessarily know by name, but Kai Zhu is a naturalized Canadian from China who was in school when he was caught crossing the border from the U.S. with, it was 52 or 55, I can't remember the number of turtles stuffed down his pants, including, one would add appropriately, if one were trying to sell books, in the crotch of his underwear, which created all sorts of jokes amongst the reporters who were covering his trial. Kai Zhu ended up getting one of the, the harshest sentences ever in the turtle world, of, uh, of smuggling and poaching. And he's in prison right now. He's in prison in Pennsylvania for five years for what he did, which he claimed is he was, he was forced to do. All graduate students, uh, hold up your ears, he was, and undergraduates too, he was forced to do in order to pay his university costs. Uh, and, and this is how he said that he was feeling his tuition. At, at any rate, he's uh, in prison for five years. So it was a paper trail exercise, such as you all have been doing, to follow that case with the court documents and with talking to his lawyers, because he's working very hard at getting, taking advantage of the transfer treaty that exists between the United States and Canada. And, and uh, in that manner, he could serve out his sentence, which probably would be probation at this point in Canada, without having to be in this prison in, in uh, the U.S. There is footnote, a prison where he is, if you may know this, I didn't until, and this is one of the fun aspects of research, of course, it's a learned thing you never thought you might learn. It, he's in a prison in Pennsylvania that is, the population is largely foreign nationals, not U.S. citizens are in this prison. One of the things, he's an interesting guy, talked a lot to his father, trying to facilitate an interview with him. It, when he first went to prison, he taught himself Spanish so that he could teach the Mexicans with whom he was in prison, English. But in order to teach them English, he felt he had to learn Spanish first. So he's, he's not a dummy, except when it comes to how to pay for his university education. And, and, uh, and so that was, that was largely traditional kind of paper trail court documents and in retelling what happened to him based on the documents for his trial. Questions, thoughts, turtle stories. Yes, sir. Well, it sounds just like a lot of these illegal businesses. It sounds very lucrative and very tempting to get into it. After your research, do you find any hope for conservancy of these turtles or any particular turtles? It's really hard to maintain an optimistic attitude, and I struggle with that and work very hard. And there are there are some reasons to believe that the efforts of conservationists are combating the trafficking. We still have habitat loss as a major factor. 
but as long as there is this this draw in Asia with the money that is there, it's hard to imagine relatively impoverished people in the southeast of the U.S. not falling prey to that. One of the one of the things that um, was hopeful for some people was the idea that these turtles could be farmed. And if these turtles are farmed, then they can the population can be maintained and they can still be used for that litany of five things, pets, ornaments, traditional Chinese medicine, aphrodisiacs, and I always forget the last one, uh, food. And, um, and the problem with that is if I invite all of you guys up to dinner tonight, over to my house for dinner, and I say, let's have salmon, which would you like? Farmed Atlantic salmon or wild Pacific salmon? Wild. So we're in the same boat that with, with, the, with that as a solution, that those, the, that the appetite for those five aspects of using turtle also claim that it's better if it's wild. Hmm. So that's a drag. Yes, sir. Uh, I thought it was long form uh, you know, a book about uh, science. Uh, you mentioned that you know, in your trail of, of your research, you're going from all over, you're jumping around all over the place. Um, how did you have one, like a common narrative arc or a spine to this, you know, to lead the reader through? It, it was this, like you said, with your personal anecdote that you left Well, you what, what really served it was Fred. Yeah. And 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 the the problems as you define them are real. It's it's all over the place geographically. The the story is complex because of the, because it, well it, it crosses time from from way before the current era. It crosses cultures and and uh, there there are these five different aspects to why people want them. So it it. it it creates this complexity that you describe. That's why the the flow, the table of contents, is as it is to try to confine it to types of situations. But Fred, I hope, Fred serves the purpose of the the story. Fred arrives in the styrofoam box from shipmyreptiles.com, and he, you'll still buy and read the book and send it for Christmas presents next year and all of that. He leaves from uh, FedEx over in Springfield as the book ends. And I got this just gift from Beverly at, at, uh, at FedEx. Buy at least for now, Fred, I say. And at the FedEx shipping center, Beverly looks at the box and the Sharpie marked words, live animal. What you got in there, she asks, lizards, snakes, Fred, I tell her, he's a box turtle. Beverly melts. I had a box turtle in the third grade, she tells me. They're so sweet, and her face looks like a little girl's again. I took him to school with me every day in my lunchbox. <laughs> you know, what a gift. Whichever one of you guys hired her and had her there, thank you very much. <laughs> but, but that's the answer, and I hope that that works, that that, that carries the story. And I would take full credit for it, except it was my editor's idea. So trust your editors and pay attention to your editors and don't think you know everything. Uh, okay, well, I just saw one back there, Shannon, and then we'll go over here to you guys. Um, so what was more significant for you, catching the fossilized ancient turtle or petting the 100 pounds of all? Well, you're going right to my avarice. Um, <laughs> um, Well, there was something thrilling about touching the $200,000 guy, but I think I would like to hope more because of the fact that he was a survivor than that he was $200,000. And he wasn't for sale, so, but, 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 there, but it certainly was weird to think about him being $200,000. The other guy, it was amazing to touch him, but then when the, when the curator said, careful, don't break it, I really did panic because I, I realized I had mindlessly just reached out and I had a colleague with me and I was arrogantly and egoistically posing because he had a camera and I just was, I, I was too distant from the reality that I, that not just of how amazing I was, it was amazing. I did have a connection I like to think. 
hope. But I also was, it was just nuts. If I had broken, that would, would have been a different book. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you ever uh, get in contact with the people who export these things? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, the book and, is littered with these guys. Okay, and did, uh, what kind of money are they making by exporting? It, it, it differentiates. Some people are making a lot of money. Some of them are not as savvy as they should be, like it seems the guy I talked to upstate, I mean, up in, in Washington State, if he um, if he's telling the truth to both federal investigators and to me, and what they found, he's making an order. Uh, it's not nothing money, if I'm remembering correctly, maybe 20 grand every few months. That's a lot of money, but you're, you're, you're risking going to federal prison for five years. There might be another way to make enough money than, than that. Aside from, there, there is a reason it's illegal, and you, you might have some moral, ethical, complications about making your money that way. Just a little detail that, that stuck in my mind. You talked about the similarities in experience between the uh, appearance between the Yunnan and the box turtles. And then you also talked about how much effort is going into protecting the location and the existing population. So in your research, did you run across, you said there's these listings for the Yunnan turtles. Did you run across in the examples of like box turtles being represented as the more expensive ones or more broadly some of these more common species. not box turtles but some of some of the other species so yes I can't imagine poachers would be the most like scrupulous and honest no <laughs> for, for certain that that is going on and that's one of the reasons why i was in contact with the turtle conservancy when i was in asia with taking these pictures emailing them back so that that would that would inform my questioning of the sellers to make sure that what I was looking at was what they were claiming it was. And then in, invariably it was, that was the other interesting thing. They've got the product. They definitely have the product. By the way, speaking of crediting editors and such, this man is going through the text and specifically the footnotes to make sure that I, well, he's saving me from myself. Is what he's doing. So thank you very much. Turtle stories. Yes, sir. Uh, not a turtle story, I'm sorry. But, okay. but you have one. Uh, my friend. I uh, told you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but you mentioned that you were, it was difficult to be optimistic about the conservation efforts. So if we carry that logic forward, what do you think? Like, what's the next animal type that is at risk for this sort of industry? Well, the turtle is the proverbial canary in the mine shaft, or one of the proverbial canaries in the mine shaft. I think it's a it's it's broader than that. There there are all kinds of uh, niches of animal exotic animal collection and trade at the expense of the survival of species of uh, birds the, a bunch of birds and other reptiles and certainly big cats and big apes and and um bears, and bears yeah yep 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 and so really the 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 depressing part of this, or the part that should motivate us if we're looking to not be depressed, is is that, that this is a global problem. It's a problem of survival. We are in this sixth extinction, mass extinction period, supposedly, and and um, the um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a struggle to be optimistic because of the, the greed that our species engages in. And, and to talk to people who just don't care and are turning a dollar is extraordinarily depressing. Sure. Yeah, so I, I mentioned the shark fin because that's an example of a lot of this is being driven because there is demand and most of the time the to fight it, we're dealing with the supply end of it. Is, do you think there is a way of, of educating or um, kind of making people aware that that, you know, uh, turtle handbag or turtle wallet um, is not a good thing? You know, like 
if this is the, the problem to be exacerbated because of the growth of the middle class of Asia and the what you know the money that's available for buying these consumer products. So you think there's a way to come at it more on that end as opposed to the supply end. One would hope, and and it would be nice, but the again, the greed takes it doesn't just take the form of making money on the transaction. It's the collecting and the maniacal kind of collecting, which uh, is is fueled by the I want something that I can't have and nobody else has, and it's very very difficult to to fight that, and and attempts are made. I, I went to the Fish and Wildlife Service has a repository outside of Denver. It's this huge place looks like Costco um, is a 7-Eleven. It's, it's just enormous and it's packed row after row after row with seized animal products. And there were two or three rows that were just turtles and tortoises. And, and to, to see that quantity, and that's just what they've seized. It's the same thing like drugs, they, they, they success Fully grab this much out of this much, and, um, and but I, I just work at being optimistic because what's the choice? And and, and selfishly also for the book, I can't have this be a depressing book because I won't be able to sell as many of them. <laughs> but but it's, it's hard for sure. Um, this is going to be a little hard to say. Uh, I was in China uh, for 25, 40 days, and I went back again for twenty five days. So the second time I was there, um, the family, uh, my girlfriend, did cook turtle soup. I didn't. I didn't know anything about this. I just thought it's turtle soup. They're eating turtle soup. Okay, I guess you know they eat everything in China. Well, we eat everything too. So well, let's be really careful about yeah. about um, creating an us and them. Sure. Turtle sure. soup in this country in the 19th century was not was it was initially a delicacy and then it was available ubiquitously and it was on the menus of the top top uh, restaurants and turtle soup is available today we can all fly down to new orleans and we can get it at brennan's i think still has it but there's several restaurants that have it and you can buy canned turtle soup today mm -hmm. on the, the internet if you want and you, you can you can get turtle off of farms and there are any number of turtles that are not endangered that you can get go fish for and you can cook up at home yeah. and there's a guy right here on campus who's a um, renowned uh, anthropologist archaeologist and, and he's we've been eating him here according to him in oregon uh, since we first got here people and he's found these uh, prehistoric relics that are that, that prove to him that they were just cooking him up in the shell putting them upside down on the fire and and uh, eating him so so yes yeah they are notorious they for eating everything or as well they say over there in china themselves in yunnan province they'll eat anything with four legs except the table uh, I, <laughs> well i uh, i got a few beetles too so there's okay. there's that <laughs> But yeah, it was just an interesting experience, and yeah, so for sure. But turtle soup is definitely available, as are other forms of turtle. And I would have brought some, but they had already through the offices of Jared ordered the pizza. <laughs> so thank you all for coming, and I hope that uh, you will enjoy the book once it comes out and come over to my house and meet Fred. That's not Fred. <laughs> <laughs> I this I went out the with, with a guy. Thank you, Troy. Um, I went out with a guy who is um, a conservationist, and he goes out and gets um, uh, uh, these guys, uh, alligator snapping turtles, and and uh, takes care of them on his land. And he had a few of this size. And it was his idea, just as when you see the picture that's going up on my office door of me at the border by border wall, that was the border patrolman's idea. This was that guy's idea. He said, don't you want a picture with one of these alligator snapping turtles? Give me your camera. So what am I going to do? And he said, grab it like this. And he showed me how the whole thing's just going like this. It was like riding a horse trying to hold on to him. But it, 
creates uh, a certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> so, thank you all. And thank you.